And in Arizona, cases have been rising by two and a half percent. It seems to be a decline from its previous seven day average of 2.8 percent. So for more on this and the growing list of mask mandates, we're joined now by Dr. Hannah Dillon. She's an anesthesiologist who is currently caring for ICU patients with COVID-19 in Arizona. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us today. It seemed like some fairly good news in Arizona. Uh, you're on the ground there, and but we keep hearing of these case counts spiking and surges. I mean, what are you seeing on the ground in the hospitals there in Arizona? Thank you for having me, Kristen. So here in Arizona, we are still very much in a, a crisis with regards to our hospital bed availability particularly for our patients who need critical hospital beds, so our ICU beds. As of this week, our ICU bed occupancy was around 90%, meaning 90% of ICU beds in the state of Arizona are currently occupied by patients who are both positive for COVID and who have other uh, critical illnesses. To give a point of reference, around the end of March when Governor Ducey issued a shelter in place order here in Arizona that lasted for one month, our ICU occupancy was closer to 65%. And in that time, we have vastly expanded the number of beds in the state. So we are really teetering on the brink of not having any more ICU beds. So it is still quite dire here in Arizona. And is that, I feel like that's a, First of all, that's a terrifying number, 90%. And I feel as if we're starting to hear that statistic, not just in Arizona, but also in states like Florida, which, as I mentioned now, unfortunately setting a new record for the most um, amount of coronavirus deaths that they've had in just one day. I mean, are you anticipating, is your hospital and other hospitals um, around in, in Tucson, where you're located, are you guys bracing for that number, that 90% figure to tick even higher? Or are you guys expecting a decline in the coming weeks? So the saying is hope for the best and prepare for the worst. And I feel like that's what the hospitals across Arizona have been having to do for some time. That 90%, I think, even though it is a high number, can lend a false sense of comfort because People who see that think, well, that means there's still 10% available. The truth of the matter is that ICU beds are more than just a physical place. It's more than just a bed in a room. An ICU bed is also nursing and respiratory therapists and physicians capable of caring for that patient at that level of care. And so we've been employing something called the surge line in Arizona for some weeks now, whereby hospitals who are running low in resources can transfer their patients to other hospitals that have had resources come available. Uh, we do worry though, as that number continues to stay consistently above 85% over the past several weeks, that our ability to simply transfer throughout our state is going to eventually hit a wall. And we're also hearing that there's delays in the time in which that, you know, a patient can receive the results of a coronavirus test. How does that hinder, um, you know, tackling and fighting the pandemic? So that's a great question. We are having worsening times of uh, resulting for our tests. You know, a, a month ago, we could get a test result usually in two to three days. Because of the volume of tests being run here in Arizona, it's taking upwards of a week or more now. What that means for hospitals is that the patients that we think might have COVID, but we haven't verified via testing, are getting a delay in terms of some of the care that they can receive. Remdesivir, for example, is a medication that can only be given to a patient who has a PCR positive COVID test because it is so scarce. And that we are keeping patients in COVID units because we obviously don't want to expose our patients who don't have COVID who are in the hospital for other reasons. Uh, but those patients are sitting in COVID units taking up beds in those COVID units that could be going to other COVID patients. And so we'd like to be able to move those patients through to our, our sort of the non-COVID side of our hospitals, um, both for their sake and for the sake of other patients needing those resources. I want to ask you about Georgia obviously not where you're located, but the governor there overriding mask mandates in, in that, you know, local towns and cities and mayors have putting, have been putting into place. Curious to know 
uh, your thoughts. And if you think that there is some sort of failure um, of leadership of officials, not just in Georgia, but in, in other states as well, that might be you know, hampering efforts, you know, by doctors like yourself, epidemiologists, other public health officials in trying to fight the spread. So absolutely. I think one of the most concerning things for many of us working with patients day to day is that this should not be a political uh, thing. This is, this is healthcare for human beings. It should not be politicized. And simple common sense steps recommended by the CDC with evidence to back them, such as mask mandates, such as phased reopening, these things are being ignored or eschewed in favor of more politically minded measures like prohibiting mask mandates. I mean, he isn't just saying that he won't institute a statewide mask mandate for Georgia. He is saying that municipalities and cities across the state of Georgia no longer have the right to institute their own individual mask mandates. So I find the tendency towards making public health a partisan political issue to be very concerning. So on that point of, you know, coronavirus apparently becoming this political issue, I wanted to ask you about another move that we've seen from the administration, essentially forcing coronavirus data to be sent directly uh, to them instead of the CDC. That data actually now gone um, from the CDC. I, I mean, I kind of want you to put in perspective what the concern should be for everyone for the government to be making that kind of move. Sure. So the CDC has, as an institution, been our repository for the collection and coalescence of data when it comes to public health in America for decades now. They have a long-standing history of being a nonpartisan organization devoted to really collecting and then interpreting and disseminating information for the good of all. It, it is very concerning to a lot of people here and across the country who are involved with the epidemiology of this pandemic to, again, see what seems to be a partisan move to collect data in, a, in another place. If there were a reason why you know, the CDC hadn't been doing a good job or something, then we could, we could have some explanation for why that is. But taking data collection away from the organization that was created and is the expert at coalescing that data and giving it to a private corporation for reasons unknown feels very worrisome to those of us who are on the ground and who worry that there is some, some problem with our, us getting the message about what we're seeing on the ground if the data isn't supporting what we're seeing. All right, we'll have to leave that there. Anesthesiologist, Dr. Hannah Dillon, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Hey investors, Zach Guzman here. Are you interested in learning more about the markets and getting the latest financial news? Well then click right here to subscribe to our Yahoo Finance YouTube channel. Get the latest up to the minute market analysis, big interviews in the world of finance and information on how to manage your money every day wherever you are.